Isaiah 43, if you will consider with me verses 18 and 19. The Holy Spirit speaking through the prophet Isaiah says, Remember you not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. As I've said already several times this morning, we have just completed the most successful vacation Bible school that I've been privileged to be a part of. Now, the reason I say that and the, reason, the way I determine the successfulness of a Bible school is by the number of lives that are touched, the number of children that make professions of faith, the number of children that pray to be saved, the involvement of the children, the response of the children. And in 25 years, I have never seen a more responsive group of children. Amen. I've never seen children as involved in any vacation Bible school. Some of us were talking a night or two into it. And we were just in awe of how the children were responding and how they were entering into everything and we were commenting on the fact, you know, a lot of times for the first couple of nights, they sit there and they look at you like you got three eyes. You know, they just kind of, hmm. But these from the get-go were wide open. And you know what? I don't, I don't mind having rowdy kids as long as they're rowdy in the sense of excited and wanting to be a part of what's going on. And this, this group were. I mean, <laughs> they were amazing. I've never been a part of a vacation Bible school where when I pulled up and stepped on the porch, two kids met me saying, we want to get saved. Now, that's amazing to me. Basically, every night, somebody would come to Jesus. And many nights, many would come to Jesus. If you were here Friday night and and saw what happened, I said, how many of you, how many of you this year for the first time asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart? It looked like half the crowd had their hand up. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. I've never seen anything like it. And I stopped, and I was thinking about it, and I said, Lord, what's, what was the difference? What made this year so successful? Was it we had a better curriculum than usual? Was it because we had better staff than usual? And the answer, of course, was no. None of those were the reason that we had the response that we had. And then I began to pray, and I said, Lord, I want to know. Show me the difference. And God showed me seven things about the Bible school this year that caused it to stand out from all others. And I want to show them to you because... They're not just what makes Bible school awesome. But these are things that will change the world. All right. The first thing that God showed me was this. Every service we have this PowerPoint on the screen. Every time you look at it. You see 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And every time you read those words, you're reading a covenant from God. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The reason that, or one of the reasons that this year's Vacation Bible School was so successful and there was such a presence of God and there was such a response is because God was keeping His covenant. God was honoring His covenant. God was demonstrating the fact that He is a covenant-keeping God. And as we begin to pray and cry out to Him, God honored that covenant. Because going into Bible school this year, there's been more prayer than I can remember taking place. And if you'll remember the announcements, typically Sunday night we have stand-in-the-gap prayer. 
Monday night is women's prayer meeting. Tuesday midday is a men's prayer meeting that we go to. A lot of us go to at the bridge. Saturday morning is men's prayer meeting here at the church. There's been more prayer going on. And, of course, Wednesday night at our time of Bible study, the first section of that is prayer. Going through that list of names that people, that God has placed on people's hearts that we're praying for. So there's been more prayer associated with this, this, this Bible school than any that I can remember. God is honoring his covenant if my people will pray. If my people will pray. Then God was showing me that he not only honors his covenant, but he honors his promise. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 12 and 13. God speaking through Jeremiah the prophet this time said this. Then shall you call upon me and shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. Listen to that last part. You will seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. In these prayer meetings that have been taking place, I've never seen a time when people were crying out with all their heart like they are right now. Whether it be for revival, whether it be for this nation, whether it be for the lost, whether it be for a visitation from God, whether it be for a deeper relationship, I am seeing, and, and of course I'm speaking basically for men because those are the prayer meetings that I usually go to. I don't typically show up at the women's. <laughs> but if it's anything like the men's, I may start coming to it too because, man, they, they've been awesome. But I am seeing men so hungry for God that they will spend hours... You know, a lot of times when you talk about people coming together to pray, somebody will pray for five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes, and you'll think, well, it's time to go home. But I've been watching men come together and get before God and pray for hours. Pray fervently. And the Bible says an effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And that's what we've seen happen. There was much accomplished because much prayer had gone into it. And God says, when you seek me with your whole heart is when you're going to find me. Half-hearted praying doesn't work. Half-hearted service doesn't work. Half-hearted commitment to God doesn't work. God is not interested in leftovers. He says, the first fruits are mine. And when we get serious about God, God gets serious about de demonstrating his power and his presence. So the first reason that we saw many young people come to Jesus is because God was honoring the covenant that's behind me. The next reason is because God was honoring those that were seeking him with all their heart. Last Sunday, I read a passage from the end of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And it talked about, or God was speaking through Malachi, and he said, Before that day of the Lord, I'm going to send forth Elijah. And he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with destruction or with a curse. And I'm seeing men's hearts turning to children. I can remember vacation Bible school years back. When I was growing up, there were no men involved in vacation Bible school. When I was a child growing up, I can remember vacation Bible school. Every teacher was a lady. And I thank God for them. The men were not there. I also remember the food. It was Kool-Aid and saltine crackers with peanut butter. <laughs> Maybe that's why my mom had to drag me to vacation Bible school. I don't know. <clears throat> food has greatly improved through the years. 
But the thing that stands out to me that's greatly improved is the involvement of men. I was just walking around looking at how many men were teaching, how many men were taking an active part, how many men were doing everything that needed to be done in vacation Bible school. And of course, women were too, and thank God for every one of you ladies. But men are becoming more and more involved in the things of, of God, in the things of church. The men are coming to pray, the men are teaching, the men are are doing whatever the men are working with the kids and that's exactly what God said would happen in these last days that spirit of Elijah is going out across the land turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers and most of all turning the hearts of God's children back to him to come into that closer relationship and beginning again to recognize father daddy that's what he wants us to see one of the most powerful messages that I've ever heard is the message of God being our daddy. That's something that we've gotten away from. The focus has been on other things, but God is drawing us back into that father relationship. I thank God for that list of folks that we've been praying for on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights when we come together. We, we bring that list of hundreds of names and call them before God for those people that either need to be saved or they need to come back to God and one of the people on that list is a is a man in a nursing home someone that I've known for a long time and the man in, is a Jew he practices the Jewish religion and on Tuesday mornings when we go and minister at the nursing home, he would be there. And down through the weeks and the months, he would, I, I would watch him, and every now and then he would catch me, and he'd say, you know, I'm Jewish. And I'd say, yes, I know. I know you are. And he says, well, nobody comes in here and does a Jewish service. All you folks are doing Catholic services. <laughs> and to him, anybody that was, you know, not practice in the Jewish faith and was promoting Jesus Christ was Catholic and I said well I have tremendous respect and love for the Jews because through you God gave his word through you God gave his plans through you Messiah came into this earth he says well he says I I know who God is but I don't know who Jesus is Time would go by, and a lot of times he would leave whenever we were singing or, or preaching, but it, I noticed he kept staying longer and longer. Finally, he told me one day, he said, you know, he says, uh, I'm Jewish, but uh, I really appreciate you guys coming. I enjoy. And at the men's prayer meeting, we'd been praying for him and crying out to him. And last Tuesday, I preached the message of the Father. The way that God is our Father and how He loves us as a Father loves us. And the presence of God just descended on that place. And after I finished, I said, Listen, we're going to pray. And anybody here that does not know God as your Father, anybody here that hasn't accepted Jesus because He's the way to the Father, I want you to raise your hand because I'm going to pray for you. Everybody bowed their head. I started to pray, and I heard somebody saying, I believe, I believe. And I looked, and there's my Jewish friend. He's got his hand up. We led him in the center of prayer. It's one of the names that we can mark off the list because you prayed. God is showing us if we will do things his way, he will do things his way. Amen. You need to hear that. If we will do things his way, he will do things his way. And his way and his kingdom is a kingdom of power, a kingdom of glory, a kingdom that is overruling all things if we'll do it his way. So why did we see such success? Well, first of all, 
He was honoring his covenant. The next reason, he was honoring those that were seeking him with all their heart. The next reason is that he is fulfilling that prophetic word in Malachi that says, just before that day, I'm going to start turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. Prophetic fulfillment. The next reason is this. I'm not going to turn to it. But it's in Joel chapter 2. And what we are seeing, what we're seeing right now, is the preparation of the Joel generation. Now listen really carefully. We're seeing the preparation of the Joel generation. Now why do I call it that? This is what the Word says. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. We're seeing young people coming to know the Lord. We're seeing young people being filled with the Spirit. We're seeing young people becoming exciting about God because God is forming, producing, and bringing forth the Joel generation, the generation of the last days that's going to be prophesying and preaching and turning people to Jesus Christ. And it's going to be used, it's going to be the young people that carry the, the, the center force of what's about to happen. So God is bringing forth, calling forth the Joel generation that are going to show the world the truth. They're going to demonstrate the power and the presence of God. And you, we as adults, are having the privilege and the honor of helping bring forth this Joel generation that's going to change the world. I said it's going to change the world. It's going to change the world. Amen. All right. Now we're getting somewhere. When God repeats himself, he means business. All you have to do is go over to Acts chapter 2, and you find that same promise repeated. It shall come to pass. There's no question about that. It shall come to pass. Saith God, good authority, right? That in the last days, that's now, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Do you realize there's not one nation accepted? Everyone is going to have an outpouring of the spirit of God. It shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And he said, on his servants and handmaidens, he would pour out of his spirit. And he said, I will show wonders, miracles, and whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We this week had the privilege, I believe with all my heart, of helping to birth a, a, a group of evangelists, a group of preachers and prophets that are going to help turn this world right side up. Amen. Awesome. The birth of the Joel generation. The next reason that we saw such results and are seeing it not just in Bible school but in other places like the nursing homes and so on and so forth is because of something that Jesus preached when he quoted Isaiah 61. Turn over there with me. I want you to look at this. Isaiah 61. This is something the Lord spoke to me the other day. Isaiah 61, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says this. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And this is the message Jesus preached in that first Sabbath in the synagogue. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's where he stopped. Now you see, the year of vengeance of God hasn't come yet. It will. But he stopped with that verse that says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And if you look it up in Hebrew, it literally says the year of the Lord's favor. 
God has been speaking to many that I believe have a prophetic voice and saying that 2014 is the year of the Lord's favor upon his people. This is the year of the Lord's favor. This is the year that God wants to bless, that he wants to pour out his spirit, that he wants to answer prayers, and we're seeing the evidence of it. So one of the reasons that we saw the success that we did, and one of the reasons we're seeing the moving of God that we are, is because I believe this is the year of his favor for his people. God's pouring out his blessing. I've heard person after person say, it's amazing what God's doing. He provided this. He opened the door for that. He answered this prayer. He touched this person. He saved this one. He did this on and on. This is the year of God's favor. And when you're in the year of God's favor, dare to dream big. Dare to dream big. While we're here in Isaiah, go to Isaiah 44. Another reason, I believe, that we saw such a tremendously successful vacation Bible school and because we're seeing people saved and all these other things happening I believe this is one of the reasons Isaiah 44 verse 24 thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer and he that formed thee from the womb I am the Lord that makes all things that stretched forth the heavens alone that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself that frustrates the tokens of liars and makes diviners mad and turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolish. <laughs> you know, there's so many, what you would say, prophets in the world that do not prophesy the Word of God. There are prophets out there that prophesy the future, that tell you about things in your life. There's palm readers, there's tea leaf readers, there's tarot card readers, there's people that play with Ouija boards, and it just goes on and on and on. God says, you know what? He says, I frustrate the fool out of them people. He said, I make them crazy as a bat. That's exactly what verse 25 says. All these so-called wise people, <laughs> he says, I turn them backwards. I make their knowledge foolish. But now hear this that confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers. One of the reasons that we're seeing the success that we're seeing is God is confirming the prophetic word that says, it shall come to pass that I will pour out my spirit. You know, I've heard people argue this, and, and for years, with all my heart, I have believed and preached that there will be a last day's move of God, a revival like the world has never seen, an in-gathering that is, defies description, that is beyond comprehension before Jesus comes. I've believed that. I believe the Word teaches that. I believe the Word clearly shows that. And I've, I've had other preachers argue with me and say, no, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And, you know, to the point where you'll think that nobody believes anything. Well, the Bible says evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. It says that perilous times will come. It does say that. But it says this as well. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God will raise up a standard against him. It says, where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. It says, the glory of the latter house will be greater than that of the former house. And time after time, the Word of God says, I am going to pour my Spirit out. It's going to happen. And what we're seeing is God confirming the Word of His servants and performing the counsel of His messengers. He wants you to see. He wants you to believe. He wants you to be encouraged. He wants you to have hope. He wants you to realize what's taking place. Now, the seventh thing I believe is God showing us what time it is. Showing us what time it is. I'm not going to turn to it. <clears throat> but over in Luke 21, Jesus is talking. And he said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh. And as we see the things happening about us, God is just saying, look, I want you to know what time it is. It's the last of the last days. 
We're getting really close to the time that I step out on the clouds of heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together to be with the Lord forever. It's time. So you see, all these things are coming together. If you want a fancy word, it's synergy. Go look it up. I'm not even going to explain it. Synergy. But the reason that we're seeing God moving in such a way are those seven reasons. Seven reasons among others. But those are the seven that he gave me. And here's the good news. Those seven reasons don't just work for Vacation Bible School. Those seven reasons will work for a body of believers that are asking God for a great move of His Spirit. Those reasons will work for people that are crying out for a revival. Those reasons will work for people that are saying, God, come and show yourself strong. We need the miraculous. We need miracles to take place so that people's lives will be changed. Understand something. And I've heard, I've heard people say this down through the years, and it's the truth. One miracle will bring more results than a thousand sermons. And it's the truth. What drew people to Jesus? Jesus demonstrated the power of the kingdom of God. His words were not just something that somebody had taught him. He didn't just come off with this rote memorization, you know, where I, I've heard this all my life so I can spout it out. But the Bible says he spoke as one having authority. And when he spoke, hell trembled. When he spoke, demons cried out. When he spoke, Satan had to fall back. The demonic forces had to flee. When he spoke, sickness had to go away and health spring forth. When he spoke, the dead had to come back to life. When he spoke, the lost were saved. When he spoke, the lame would walk, the blind would see, the deaf would hear. And let me tell you something. The same spirit that resided in Jesus Christ is in you. In you. And if we will believe, and if we will get right with God, and if we will search for Him with all our heart, and if we will pray those effectual, fervent prayers, and if we will not give Him the leftovers, and if we will give Him the very best of everything that we have, He'll do the same thing today through us. Jesus said, the things that I do, you will do also, and greater things because I go to the Father. The significance of that was the fact that when he went to the Father, the Holy Spirit would come to this earth. The one who is our helper, the one who's our guide, the one who's our comforter, the one who's our teacher, the one who empowers us, the one who shows us things to come and talks of what he hears in heaven. Jesus said, because the Holy Spirit will be in you and with you, you will be my witnesses. And the greatest witness on the planet is a demonstration of the power of the kingdom of God. When somebody in the name of Jesus lays hands on the sick and they're healed, that's a witness. The Bible says with great power gave the disciples witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, what was the, what was the witness of his resurrection? It was the miraculous the miraculous. It wasn't just somebody saying, yeah, he's risen from the dead. It was demonstrating that resurrection power because the Bible says the same power that raised Jesus from the dead will quicken your mortal body. That's what the Word says. So if you and I will put these things into practice, God will begin to do what God does. And what God does is supernatural. What God does is so far beyond what you and I can do that there is no comparison. The reason that we have seen such a uh, failure in the church in America is because there have been such lack as far as prayer goes. There has been such lack as far as giving God the best. There has been such lack in making Him King and, glory and, and, and Lord in our lives. Because we want just enough of Him for fire insurance, but we still want to do our own thing. We want to do our own thing. And this, this story, this, I, I've used this before, but it's, 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 it, it proves the point. It seems that this man owned a trucking company. It was a construction trucking company. And he had large triaxle dump trucks. 
and he was hiring drivers. And he was trying to find good drivers. And his test was this. He would get somebody that wanted to be a driver. And he would take them out to a construction site. And this construction site had this large pit that they'd been excavated. And he would talk to the man and he'd say, listen, how close to that edge of that cliff do you think you can get my truck without it going over? And somebody would say a couple of feet. Somebody else would say hmm, 18 inches. Somebody said, well, I'll probably get it within a foot of it. And this other guy was standing there, and he says, well, how close do you think you could get? And he said, listen, I'll keep your truck as far from that edge as I can keep it. He said, you're hired. And that's the thing. What we've got to do is view our relationship with the Lord like this. Not how much sin I can get by with and still have fire insurance, but how far I can stay from the things that offend God. That's what we've got to do. God did not save us to have one foot in the world doing our thing and the other foot in the kingdom of God trying to be holy enough to get into heaven. God says, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to be my disciples, then you're going to have to take up the cross daily and follow me. The cross was something that was not a beautiful ornament that you hung around your neck to be in style. The cross was an implement of destruction. It was something that meant there's a sacrifice about to be made. Something's going to die. And when we become a child of God, the old man is to be crucified. All those de desires that draw us away from God are supposed to be put to death. And we live for Him. We're supposed to be raised in newness of life. And when we say, well, you know, how much beer can I drink and not lose my salvation? How many, what's the rating on the movies that I can watch and still not be condemned? Can I go to PG? Can I go to R? Well, I understand I'm not supposed to go to X. Yeah, I got that down. Folks, listen. If that's the discussion that's going on in our mind, we're not right with God. What God wants are people that say no to the things of this world, no to the things of the flesh, and yes to Him. Lord, I want to see the world saved. I want to see my children walking with Jesus. I want to see my grandchildren preaching the gospel. I want to see the world turned around. And Lord, I am willing to deny the things of this, this life, deny the things of the flesh, and give myself totally to you. Work through me to change the world. Here I am. Send me. That's what he's after. That's what he wants. He doesn't want half-hearted Christians. He doesn't want people that say, well, yeah, I'm going to go to church on Sunday, but as soon as church is over, I'm heading out to do my own thing. You're not right with God. You're not right with God because God saved all of you. He didn't save just your Sunday morning self. He didn't save just a little piece of you so that you could be there on Sunday and on Wednesday if you were a complete fanatic. No. No. He, he, you see, he gave him whole, his whole self. His whole person was on that cross with spikes through his hands and nails through his feet, a crown of thorns on his head and a spear in his side. And the blood that he shed was all his blood, not just a few drops. He is looking for people that will totally and completely surrender their life to Him so that the loved ones can be saved, so that God can work through them and change this world. Folks, listen, listen. What does it say? I will heal their land. Do you see that? That's what it says. I will heal their land if my people, if my people, Christians, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And then here's the one, turn from their wicked ways. He's talking to Christians. What do you mean wicked ways? When we compromise with the world, it's wickedness. When we feed on the world's junk, it's wickedness. When we give more to the world than we do to Him, and I'm not just talking about your wallet. I'm talking about your time. I'm talking about your efforts. I'm talking about your talents. When we give more to the world than we do to the one who gave everything for us, then it's wickedness. It's wickedness. Folks, I want to tell you, God over the past year has dealt with me 
and I needed it because I was not wholeheartedly sold out, completely given to him. And I've had to repent and repent and repent. And I ask you to forgive me because I have not given you what you've needed. But I'm trying to make up for lost time. I'm asking God to redeem the time that's left that I can preach the Word of God, that I can preach the Word with fire, that I can preach the Word with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that I can preach a Word that's going to bother you. Bother you until you do something about it. We're going to have to stand before him. You might say, well, I'm saved. Why do I have to stand before him? The Bible says every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Not to find out if you get in or not, but to hear him say either well done or why not. Or why, not? why? Why, when I gave everything for you, did you not give everything for me? Why didn't you serve me after I shed my blood that your sin could be washed away, that your name could be written in the Lamb's book of life, that you could have a place in heaven prepared for you where you could walk streets of gold and live in a place of indescribable beauty forever? Why? What was so important in this world that you took most of your time and devoted it to it when I called you to be my child? I called you to be my witness. I called you to be my messenger. I called you to carry the gospel and change lives. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And it will save. It will save. We've seen it this week. It'll save. It will change the lives of people. Listen, without the Word of God, without the Gospel, children are destined to fail. Without the Word of God, children are destined to fail. Here's what I mean. The Word that we spoke over this precious child this morning. Your children will be taught of the Lord, and great will be the peace of your children. Well, if your children aren't taught of the Lord, what's going to be the result? It's not going to be peace. It's going to be turmoil. It's going to be confusion. It's going to be all kinds of things because there's going to be this struggle that's going on within them. Within them, they're going to have to be determining and deciding what to do. Listen, folks. If we are not bringing up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, if parents aren't walking before them to show them how much that God means to them, if grandparents aren't taking those children and praying with them and teaching them the Word of God and showing them the love of Jesus, here's what's going to happen. The world is going to fill them with all kinds of junk. Video games are going to teach them how to kill one another, blow one another's heads off, chop each other up with a sword. Folks, the violence that's on television, the sex and, the, and degradation that's on TV is going to brainwash those children and turn them into what we're seeing in the world right now that's why we're here is to be those that invade the kingdom of darkness and turn that kingdom upside down and to bring those that are enslaved out and set them into the kingdom of light that's what it's all about getting saved isn't just for you to be having this insurance policy that, yeah, I'm going to go through life and I know that when it finally ends up and when it's all over, it's going to be okay because I'm going to heaven. Do you think God is going to say, well done, if that's the way you spend your life? I want you to be my witnesses, Jesus said. He didn't say anywhere in the Word of God that He saved you to kick back till He came. He said, listen... You're going to be my witnesses. You're going to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to go out and you're going to tell people about me. You're going to tell them about my resurrection. You're going to tell them about the love of the Father. You're going to tell them that God loved them so much that he himself paid the price for their sin. And if they'll just believe, if they'll accept Jesus, they're going to be born again. Their name will be written in heaven. And then they can go out and tell somebody else. And we can empty hell and populate heaven. That's what it's about. This isn't what you expected when you showed up this morning, was it? Actually, it wasn't what I had in mind either. But I have to tell you what God tells me. When the Spirit whispers in my ear, He says, shout it from the rooftops. i got to tell you what God says. Now listen. The Word of God says this. Choose you this day who you will serve. Choose you this day who you will serve. 
And all I can say is, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Amen. Remember what Elijah said to that bunch on Mount Carmel? He said, fellas, how long are you going to vacillate between two opinions? If Baal is God, well, hey, let's serve him. If Jehovah's God, let's serve him. But let's stop trying to serve them both because, you see, they were. They were trying to serve both. They wanted to appease Jehovah because they knew he was prone to do things that were rough on them. But they also wanted to please Baal because they saw Baal as the god of fertility. They wanted their crops to be good. They wanted their herds to be prolific. They wanted everything to be good. And Baal was pretty much of a party animal too, you know. So they wanted to serve everybody, kind of like we are in this country today. We don't want to offend anybody, so we're going to serve everybody. Everything is cool. All roads lead to heaven. Doesn't matter. That's our philosophy today. But folks, let me tell you something. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said there is a broad path. There's a wide gate. The only problem is it leads to destruction. There's a lot of people on that road. Because he said there is straight and narrow a pathway that leads to life and few there be that find it. Now, God has placed us all along that broad road. And as people are progressing down that road, hell-bent, they are on destruction. They don't realize that, but they are. God has placed you and I along that road to say, wait, let me tell you something. There's another way. God has placed you and I along that road to show the love of the Father to those that don't understand. God has placed us there not to sit in our easy chairs by that road, not in our stadium seating, not in, in our camp chairs kicked back with a cold one saying, you know, boy, look at all that traffic. Ain't that something? Man, I'm glad I'm not in that congestion. I'm just going to sit here till Jesus comes. Man, I don't want to hear the tongue lashing that we're going to get if that's our philosophy. God saved us with a purpose. He said, occupy till I come. Be about my business. What did Jesus do when he came? Even as a child, he said, do you not understand? I got to be about my father's business. You know what? You are joint heirs with Jesus. The same spirit that God placed on his son is the spirit that he's placed into your heart. That same spirit that caused Jesus to cry out, Abba, Father, is in your heart, and it should produce the same thing in you. And we should be doing the same thing Jesus did, turning people off that road onto that upward road that leads to life. But, folks, we've got to choose. We've got to choose who we're going to serve. No man can serve two masters, the Word of God says. We can't do it. You'll love one and hate the other. That's what the Bible tells us. And that's, what Josh, that's why Joshua said, look, you've got to choose today who you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Folks, we've got to make that choice. If we want to see God's word confirmed, if we want to see the power of God released in this world, if we want to see lives forever changed, if we want to see the gates of hell kicked in, if we want to see Satan robbed, if we want to see heaven populated, then we've got to do those things that we're talking about today. We've got to give him our all. We've got to give him our best. We have to put him first. We have to choose who we're going to serve. We've got to enter into this covenant with him. If my people which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. We've got to begin to cry out to him and seek him with our whole heart. We've got to realize that as we look around and see things happening, it's the fulfillment of the prophetic that God's word contains telling us these are the last days. If we're going to see this happen, we've got to realize that the Joel generation is coming forth, and we need to pray for them and support them and lift them up.
We've got to realize that this is the year of God's favor, that he is reaching out and saying, come on. I want you to walk with me. I want you to run with me. I want you to dream with me. I want you to ask bigger things, greater numbers. I want you to believe for more people to be saved. I want you to believe for those prodigals that are away that it doesn't seem like are coming back. I want you to believe that they're going to come back. I want you to go after those that everybody says is hopeless. There's no way they're going to be saved. They're drunks. They're drug addicts. They're this, they're that, or the other. Listen, God specializes in those. Go get them. It's the year of God's favor. It's the year that he's confirming the word of his messengers and his prophets. And it's God telling us what time it is. So let me leave you with this. As we think about what we've seen here this week, I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be encouraged to believe for greater things, greater harvest, miracles to take place. I want to urge you to jump in with both feet. I want you to expect more from God. I want you to expect the lost to be saved, the captives to be set free, bondage to be broken. I want you to expect whole areas to turn to Jesus. I want you to be alert for the counterattacks of the enemy. I want you to have on the whole armor of God. But folks, God's showing us what he'll do if we'll do what he said. God will do what he said if we'll do what he said. Bow your heads, please. Father, I am so thankful for what you've done this week. I'm so thankful for every young person that committed their life to Jesus. And Lord, I'm praying for every household, every household where somebody came to know the Lord. And Lord, I know that many of those households don't have parents that are serving you. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that that little child will lead them. I pray that that little child will be God's invasion into that home I pray that little child will be the seed that's planted and God I pray that you water it and and you shine upon it and Lord I pray that that little child will be such an influence that the parents will fall on their knees and cry out for forgiveness and salvation I pray that brothers and sisters will come to know the Lord and I pray that those families will get into church where the gospel is preached where the power of God is there where the spirit of the Lord is in residence God, I ask that. And Father, as I see you beginning to do these things, God, I pray that your people will be encouraged, that your people will begin to believe you for greater things, that they'll begin to ask for things that seem to be impossible and just have the audacity to believe that we serve a God of the impossible, a God that will move when we ask as we do what he commands us to do. Father, I thank you and praise you. And Lord, as we're here this morning and as we're bowing in your presence as we're coming to the end of this service Lord I would be remiss if I didn't ask this question as your heads are bowed this morning if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior if you've never gotten on your knees and said God be merciful to me a sinner I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came, that He lived, that He died on Calvary's cross, that He rose from the dead and ascended back into heaven, that He's seated at His Father's right hand praying for me right now. God, I ask you to forgive me, and I ask you to come into my heart. I ask Jesus to be my Savior. If you've never done that this morning, this is your moment. Time is short. This this thing is winding up, folks. I'm not talking about this service. I'm talking about life on this planet as we know it. If you're here this morning and you're not certain of your relationship with Jesus, wherever you are in this house, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand so I can pray for you. Time's short, folks. This is serious business. This is serious business. If you're not right with God this morning, this is the moment that God is extending his hands and saying, listen, it's the year of my favor. It's the year of my favor. I want to bless you. Any more? Thank you for that hand. Any others? Anyone else? Father God, you know our hearts. You know the place that you occupy. 
you know how much is surrendered to you you know the parts that are not and Lord I pray that this would be a day of surrender I pray this would be a day that we would repent of all sin God that this would be a day that we would repent of everything that we have kept back from you I pray that this would be a day that we totally give ourselves to you so that you can do what you want to do what you alone can do as our heads are bowed I just this is something I got to do if you're here this morning if you're here this morning and you haven't completely surrendered your life to Jesus if there's areas of your life that you know that you've not given him and you want to do that You want him to take it all. And you want his power to flow through you. And you want him to use you to turn a world upside down. I'm going to ask you to slip out of your seat and just come down here and kneel at the altar. For some area of your life that you need to surrender to him this morning, I'm asking you to do that. Because this is the year of his favor. This is the year that he's saying, look, come. I'm going to give. I want to do things in your life that you've, that's just beyond comprehension. I'm asking you to give it to Jesus. Give it to Jesus. Listen, whatever you give, he will give you 10 times over. Anything that you surrender to him, he will take and he will bless you as you've never been blessed before. So for something you need to give him today, please. Give it to God. Jesus. Jesus. Lord, I'm so thankful for these that have come and knelt in this altar. I'm so thankful for people that are becoming hungry for you. God, I'm so thankful for people whose hearts you're laying hold on and say, Listen, I am your Father. I love you so much. And I want us to have this relationship that is so close that nothing can come between us. Give me your life. And I will take that life and I will make something out of it that you can't even imagine. I will bless you and I will fill you with joy and I will fill you with peace and I will grant you fulfillment. And you're going to know what it means to be walking in my ways and have my spirit upon you and my power flowing through you. You're going to know what it feels like to lay hands on somebody that's sick and see them be healed in Jesus' name. You're going to know what it feels like to to be sharing with somebody that's lost and have them say, tell me how to be saved and lead them to Jesus. You're going to know what it feels like that when you're confronted with someone that's oppressed or possessed by demonic forces to be able to say, in the name of Jesus, release this person and trouble them no more and see that person set free. Father, I pray for every person that's nailed in this altar this morning. And I pray in Jesus' name that you would help them to surrender everything. Say, Lord, here my life is. I give it to you. Take it all, every area, every aspect, every thought, everything that is in me is now yours. And I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. I ask you to fill me till there's no room for anything that the enemy would try to place there. And God, that's what I'm asking for right now. Lord, for every one of these people kneeling here today, I pray that as they surrender to you, that your spirit would come in like a flood. Lord, that you would fill them to overflowing, that the joy of the Lord would rise up within them, that the power of God would descend upon them, that that the fullness of the Holy Spirit would be in residence. And every gift and every fruit of the Spirit would be in them and upon them. And you would use them mightily to turn this 
area and not just this area. But Lord, this nation, this world upside down or right side up. God, I ask you to do that. And Lord, I know that as these come and they kneel before you this morning, that Satan is infuriated. Because if he can't keep us from being saved, then he will do all that he can to keep us from being completely surrendered to the word and the will of God. But Father, look. <laughs> look at your children this morning as they gather in your presence and say, I'm coming to give it all to you. Lord, I, I, I can only imagine the joy in your heart today as you see these kneel and say, here I am. Here I am. Every area of my heart, every area of my mind, every area of my spirit, every part of my soul, every part of my body, I give to you and I say, Lord, use it for your glory. Wash me, cleanse me, fill me, use me. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. And I pray that you answer the cry of every heart gathered here right now. Meet every need. And Lord, as they pray, give them the desire of their heart today. Give them the desire of their heart. As you are kneeling here this morning, I believe that the Spirit of God would say to you that I am so pleased. My heart is blessed. I am ready to work through you. I am ready to guide you to fulfill your destiny because you were brought into the kingdom for such a time as this. I have plans for you greater than any you can imagine. I have joy in store for you that you have not yet experienced. I have power that will be released in you that will defy logic. I will show myself strong through you and to you. And I will change the lives of the people that you come in contact with. I hear your prayers. I store them up. Not one falls to the ground. The answer will come. Do not fear. Do not be discouraged. I will bring it forth. I am doing a new thing. You are just beginning to know it. I am making a way for you to walk. I am pouring out water that will cause those that you encounter to be thirsty for me. And I will use you to change many lives. Father, I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for the hour in which we live. I thank you that your spirit is moving. I thank you that you're birthing the Joel generation. I thank you, Lord, that we are about to see what the prophets longed to see. I thank you, Lord, that we're about to see the things that angels desire to look into. Lord, I thank you that we're about to see untold multitudes come to Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that we are about to see a nation change direction. Father, in Jesus' name, I bless every person in this room. I bless those seated in the pews, and I bless those gathered in the altar. And Lord, I thank you that your army is standing up. And the army that you are bringing together is going to arise. And as that song says, in the name of Jesus, they're going to break every chain. In the name of Jesus, they're going to tear down walls that separate. In the name of Jesus, they're going to set captives free. In the name of Jesus, they're going to restore to those that have been robbed. In the name of Jesus, they're going to draw and, and see those prodigals come home. In the name of Jesus, they're going to see lost people saved. In the name of Jesus, they're going to see miraculous signs and wonders take place. So, Father, I bless 
all these today. And Lord, as one, we say, here we are. Use us for your glory. Use us for your glory, Lord. And God, let us press on and believe you for greater and greater and greater things because you're a God that has no limit. So, Father, thank you. We love you, Father. We thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, Lord, fill us again with the Holy Spirit and use us for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen.